Steve Kornacki is national political correspondent for NBC News. You see him often around campaigns and election nights in front of what the network calls the big board. He recently finished a seven-part podcast series called The Revolution with Steve Kornacki. It's the story of how the Republicans took over the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. That happened in 1994 and was organized and led by former Georgia Congressman and Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Steve Kornacki, what got you interested in politics? Geez, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know what it was, but first time I was kind of, um, kind of exposed to it, I was just interested right away. Um, I think I was, um, I was a kid uh, in about sixth grade, it would have been. And uh, it was a Mass I grew up in Massachusetts, Massachusetts governor's race, 1990. Bill Weld was the Republican. John Silver was the Democrat. Um, some said that Weld was more liberal than Silver. Silver was more conservative than Weld. The roles might have been, the party roles might have been reversed. It was an interesting race. But my class did a, uh, a mock election, and uh, they, I played uh, John Silver, and um, that was my first kind of, um, you know, threw myself into it. And uh, um, it's one of those things where you, you don't, um, you know, it, it, the whole world of politics that I knew at that point was just that one race, that one campaign. And I can look back at it now, 30 years later, and say, wow, those were some, those were some interesting characters. That was an interesting race, and that was a very unique way to get into it. But I think I kind of caught, caught the bug then, and, and that was that. What was the atmosphere at home when they sit, saw you getting interested in all this? <laughs> They were, um, um, I don't want to say horrified, but the thing that would happen was, uh, and this is the old days, this is, you know, internet was basically non-existent. And um, uh, when I started to get interested, I, I, I love to collect campaign literature. Uh, I would write to campaigns and, you know, try to get bumper stickers and buttons and things like this. And so we got on, it, it put my family on all of these political mailing lists. Um, and my mom hated that because she, she thought the mailman would get a set. She, my mom's view was you know, politics is our own business. This is not to be talked about outside the family or anything. And so she thought, you know, we were giving away clues to the mailman about what her politics were. What, uh, what was the political atmosphere in your own home? And did you have uh, brothers and sisters at all that were interested in this? Uh, so there's, I have an older sister, about a year, year and a half older than me. Um, she was not particularly interested um, in politics. Um, I would say it was, my, my mom was more, um, she's still alive, but uh, uh, more of a Democrat, my dad more of a Republican. So they would, they would that was the thing I learned early. They, they would both go and vote in elections and cancel each other out. <laughs> what about the, the tying politics then to journalism? When did that happen? Um... Yeah, I started, um, uh, I think one kind of flowed naturally from the other because you know, I got interested in politics and found myself just, you know, consuming, uh, you know, again, newspapers were still the dominant the dominant thing back then. And so, you know, wanted to write for the school newspaper, um, you know, in high school. So, you know, it was the, uh, uh, edited that with a friend of mine, um, contributed articles, you know, to the local newspaper and, got very interested in, you know, local, you know, small town Massachusetts politics. And um, so I think it was, it was just kind of always there, um, you know, from that point forward. Anybody that you admired in journalism at that time that got your attention? Um, sure, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, I think Tim Russert, um, you know, in hindsight, uh, this was right around the time, this is, you know, early 1990s, he was just taking over Meet the Press. And I think he really kind of, revolutionized the show and and the genre really the sunday the sunday show genre um and obviously i'll always associate him with the with the 2000 election um the endless night the endless you know 40 nights that followed um but i thought he was just a great kind of narrator of that you know of that whole drama um i i always liked you know again a formative experience for me was the 92 presidential campaign clinton bush perot and that was, if you remember, you know, that was sort of the talk show campaign where they all suddenly started appearing. You know, Clinton was on Arsenio Hall's show and Ross Perot was doing his town halls. And 
uh, Larry King was a was a central figure. They all started going on Larry King's show. Um, and, you know, obviously Larry King did more than just politics. You'd have, you know, old Hollywood stars one night. But but I that became I remember um, I, I was I was always curious who was going to be on Larry King's show. Um, I liked his style. I always liked his style. I know he took some some heat because, you know, he wasn't prosecutorial with the interviews. He gave the, the guests room, let them be kind of expansive. Um, but I actually I did find you would often learn more just kind of, you know, having him let them talk. And and sometimes he would just throw in kind of a random question that no one no one else would think to ask. And, and I think you'd, you'd get some insight when you come in contact with the public. <clears throat> excuse me. What's the thing that they say to you about seeing you in front of the big board, watching you on MSNBC, asking questions? Or what is it that the what's the obvious thing they say to you when you meet people? Um, yeah, they usually ask where the, where the board is, <laughs> try to explain. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, lug it around with me. Um, you know, the, I, I, it's, it's this weird thing that I still don't fully understand where I, I the, 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 the pants that I was wearing, um, you know, during the election in 2020, which I, not an intended thing, not a planned thing. It, it's not even a, 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 a this khakis, uh, not even a, a thing I always wear, but it just, it, it was COVID, uh, there were limited options. I just, I had a pair of khakis on and realized we had 15 minutes to go before I had to go on air. So I just tucked my shirt in and went on the air. And then people started associating me with the pants, which it, it's, trust me, I, I'm still baffled by it, but I do get that a lot. And isn't there such a thing as Kornacki khakis now that you can buy at the Gap? <laughs> I think they proposed something like that. Unfortunately, my uh, my contract with NBC doesn't let me cash in like that. But we got him to make a uh, we got him to make a donation. So, so I thought that was good. One of the reasons we asked you to chat with us on this podcast was your seven part series started out as a six part series called "The Revolution with Steve Kornacki." What was it? What is it? It's still there. Yeah, it's a podcast. Um, it's it's the story of the 1994 Republican Revolution. Um, you know, Republicans take over the House for the first time in 40 years. Newt Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House. Um, but really, what it is, it's it's the story of the the long uh, road to 1994, which is which is an almost two decade story, where you know Newt Gingrich is the central player. Um, you know, somebody who comes to Congress on his third try in 1978, you know, at that point, the Republicans are just absolutely buried in the minority. They have been at that point for a generation. Um, the culture of the House it, it is such that, you know, just about every Republican assumes they will spend their entire career in the House in the minority. Nobody can even conceive of anything other than Democratic control of the House and Gingrich's idea uh, from day one is to create a Republican majority, and he believes there's there are um, uh, there are things that Republicans need to learn and do, and and the podcast is the story of of over a decade and a half of how he slowly convinces, wins converts, brings in new recruits, convinces his party through a series of sort of a very dramatic um, you know moments and dramas and spectacles on the House floor. Um, he slowly wins his party over. And it all culminates in, you know, um, what I try to, you know, here we are starting this po this uh, the, the, this interview talking about uh, me becoming interested in politics in the early 1990s. I mean, I can remember the run up to the 94 midterm and everybody knew it would be a good midterm for Republicans, a bad one for Democrats, Bill Clinton's first midterm. But I also remember just absorbing the media coverage and nobody in the media was talking about Republicans getting control of the House. They were saying, hey, maybe they'll get 20 seats here. This would be a really good night for them. And I remember the shock of, uh, of that election. And, and when I talked to, um, finally talked to Gingrich, that's the seventh episode, um, he likened the 94, uh, election night 94, and the shock that it generated to um, Donald Trump winning in 2016. And I, I think that's right. I think, I think the two were, I think the two were just in terms of blowing it everybody's expectations, at least in a sort of media class. I think the two are, are kind of on the same level. Well, you talked to him um, in that seventh episode uh, after <clears throat> the original six were done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, why 
and you tell us all through the six that he you ask him and he wouldn't uh, sit down for an interview. Why do you think he eventually said yes? I've listened to it, of course, and he says some nice things about you. Uh, and w why do you think he was not participating? And then why did he decide to? Yeah, he said, I, I mean, I, I, you know, we, we asked him basically that question. He said, you know, something you know, that they've been interested in. There were some scheduling issues. So maybe it was as simple as that. But, um, you know, I, I, I think I could understand with any, you know, public figure, if you if you say you're setting out to kind of, you know, tell their story and, and go really deep. And, and Gingrich has certainly been a, a controversial figure, you know, through the years. Um, there might have been some skepticism of, you know, what's what's the angle here? Uh, and I, 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 I think you know, my sense is he heard the finished product and he said it. I mean, in, in the interview, he felt it was fair. Um, and, and that's what I that's what, you know, I set out to do. That's what we set out to do with this um, to, to tell, I think, what is a really important and rich um, and fascinating and, and in a lot of ways fun story of, of modern political history um, and to do it in a way that that um, I don't think was fawning but was was fair and I you know he he seemed you know when I asked him why afterwards he wanted to sit down he did say you know he felt it was he felt it was fair and it was accurate and 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 then uh, he wanted to uh, he wanted to talk and we were happy to I will say that there was a moment in your interview with him which <laughs> was kind of interesting when he was talking, and he does has done this for years, about the elite media. And I think you asked him, who are the elite media? And he said, you. Uh, <laughs> how much do you think, though, that he didn't talk to you in the beginning because you work for a left of center organization, MSNBC? I, you can't, can't say that about the entire NBC operation, but do you think that he was suspicious that your, um, your politics or the network's politics would get in the way? I think it's possible. Yeah. You know, it, it was, um, uh, yeah, that was, that was a, um, uh, a funny moment I thought in the, in the interview with him, but yeah. And I, I think, look, he's, he's, um, we got into it a little bit in the interview, just in terms of, you know, one thing I was asking him was about, you know, his own attitude, attitudes on the right towards the media, you know, cause it's, it's, it's been a, been around for, you know, 50 years. I mean, you had Spiro Agnew, you know, railing against the media, you know, at the, the late sixties, early seventies. But one thing I asked him in the interview was, is it is it more palpable now on the right? Has it has that sense of um, uh, hostility toward distrust of, you know, the mainstream elite media, whatever you want to call it, is it worse now than it was? And he didn't hesitate and said, yes, absolutely. And so, yeah, I suspect, you know, whether it was MS or whether it was NBC, even, um, I, I, I suspect that there was, you know, suspicion on his part. And again, once he heard the final product and maybe it wasn't what he thought it might be. Step back from the, for a moment from the whole project. When did you decide that you wanted to do this? And once you got, was it your ideas? And then once you got it, how did you get this through the NBC programming operation? And especially the kind of time that you had to use in order to get there? So this is, I always tell people my favorite thing about working at NBC is um, access to the archives. And um, I'm, I'm sitting at my desk right now, actually, in my office, and I, I've got, you know, a searchable database of, of NBC News. Um, it's spotty once you get back before about 1980, but um, you can pull up the NBC Nightly News. You can pull up individual reports, the Today Show, Meet the Press. It's just all, you know, keyword searchable. And I can, I can literally get lost in that thing for days. Um, you know, I'm the kind of person, I mean... <laughs> I tell you about getting interested in politics as a kid in the early 90s. You know, I would I would take the train into Boston, go to the Boston Public Library, go to the microfiche department, and I would just call up a month's worth of old newspapers and just pour through them and absorb them and really try to understand, hey, you know, 1976 presidential campaign, what was it like to, to experience that in real time? So I've always been interested in, in trying to kind of reconstruct history through, you know, through media, through these types of sources. So I have been, you know, pitching folks, you know, in this building for years on the idea of doing something that's archive driven, um, that's, you know, a podcast that's that's archive driven. So finally, um, you know, about a year or so ago, we got the green light to do a podcast, they wanted to, to release it just before the midterm elections. So there was some notion of having it midterm related. Um, and we were talking about it and trying to talk through, okay, well, you know, 
we do a series of uh, of podcasts that explore different pivotal midterm elections in history. And as the conversation kind of came around, I think we realized, you know, why not pick what I think is the single most interesting of, of modern times and really go deep on it. And that's 94 and um, in the long road to 94. And uh, we got everybody on board with that. And yeah, it was, um, I had never done a podcast like this before. I'd never done this kind of serialized, you know, I've listened to my share of them, but I'd never done one. Um, it was a fascinating process and we, it came right down to the wire. We taped our final episode. We wanted to get it out the uh, the Monday before the uh, the midterm elections. And we, um, we got it done about the Thursday before that. How many people were devoted to doing it? Uh, we had a team of about half dozen people, um, and and one of the things I mean again, it's like I I I, I, I now I understand the process, and it was um, I liken it a little bit to what I think making a movie must be like because we would shoot these interviews, you know, we would talk to folks for an hour, two hours, sometimes even more, um, dozens, you know, of interviews, and we had you know probably hundreds of hours of, of, of just raw material. And, you know, I, you know, we put the scripts together and, you know, write, rewrite, and I have a sense of what the story arc is going to be, but just seeing it on paper and remembering all of that raw material, when I actually heard the final cut of it with the editing, with the, the thing that really blew me away was the sound that they mixed in the audio that they mixed in. Um, I really, I, I was surprised how much that I think, affected the drama affected the pacing the sense of suspense and it just added another layer to it that, that i hadn't even conceived of i didn't even know there was going to be sort of a musical you know background to it but once i heard it i was i was kind of blown away by it um so we had you know we had one person devoted just to the music and i, I wrote him a note after too just telling him like great job i i you know had something i had not even thought about at all and it added just so much to it after it ran initially, how could you tell if it was a success? Um, well, there's, I, I guess there's two, there's, do, do my, um, do my bosses think it was a success and does it meet their metrics? And I want to, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to sit down. I mean, they, everybody's here has been very kind and, and, and supportive about it, but um, hopefully that will also mean we could do another one. So we'll, we'll see about that. Um, but I, I, I wanted, um, I wanted people whatever side they were on <laughs> to listen to it and say that it was interesting and that it was fair. And that's some combination of that is the, is the feedback that I've gotten. Um, I feel like I've gotten that from folks on the left and I feel like I've gotten that from folks on the right. And I know it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. You're never supposed to do it. Never read the comments section. They always, you know, but I did, I did find myself reading through the, um, the reviews on, uh, I guess it would be Apple podcasts. And, um, I, I was, it, it seemed to me that there was a fairly equal number just based on what these folks were saying, a fairly equal number of people from the right and from the left and generally positive. And so I just, again, that's, that's what I had set out to do. I wanted something that, that, um, you know, I just feel too much of media is, is, one side talking to itself and ignoring the other. So I wanted to create something that was accessible to both sides. I have a list of six clips. I'm going to, just talking to our producers, <clears throat> I'm going to jump to the second one because we covered the first one talking about your past uh, when we started. And the second one was from episode three, talking about the Gingrich tapes and Rush Limbaugh's impact. Let's go to that and we'll get your follow up. This is Congressman Newt Gingrich. As a candidate, you've probably been listening to tapes from GOPAC all year. Each one of you personally brushes the teeth every morning of the human being who is morally responsible for whether this country is free and prosperous and safe. In some respects, it was kind of an intimate relationship because it was just Newt and I in the car, and uh, we had an hour and a half together, and he talked about issues that ranged from... Uh, taxes to spending, uh, welfare to workfare, uh, foreign policy issues. This is Gil Gutnicht, a Republican from Minnesota. And the tapes have become the stuff of conservative legend. Gil Gutnicht would ultimately decide to run for Congress in 1994. And as he recalls, the tapes were key to that decision. But, he stresses, they were only part of it. 
I think it, it was it was a lot of things. There was a confluence. There was Rush Limbaugh on the radio. There were the the Go Pack tapes. Um, it was almost like the German word is Zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. That's right. Rush Limbaugh on the radio. I say on the radio, I'm not trying to persuade anybody. Don't worry about me. Hell no. I'm I'm just a guy on the radio having fun. Am I trying to get anybody elected? No. Already did. <laughs> Already did is what he said. Gingrich and allies like Rush Limbaugh would eventually get a lot of people into office. It almost sounded like uh, Carlin with that humor, uh, <clears throat> Steve Kornacki. The tapes. What what are you talking? What is he talking about there? That Gil Gutnick listened listened to the tapes. Yeah, for for you know folks who are a little younger than me maybe and and, and don't remember the audio cassette, but that was you know the 1980s, early 1990s. Um, you're driving around in your car. You had AM, FM radio, and you had a cassette player. Um, and then maybe in a newer model car, you could put a, a CD in or something. That was that was revolutionary. And Gingrich, what he was trying to do was he was trying to sort of um, he was trying to bring like minded folks to the House, to Congress from all over the country. And this was part of his strategy of, of kind of reaching out to to recruits. He had was an organization called Go Pack. Um, it, it had started, I think, in the 1970s. Pete DuPont, who'd been the governor of Delaware, ran for president in 1988. He had he had originally been running it. He stepped down to run for president in 88 and Gingrich then a uh, a rising kind of congressman from Georgia um, took it over, and Gingrich would record these these audio tapes that were um, sometimes they'd be you know just speeches that he delivered, sometimes they'd be explicit sort of instructions to or, or you know kind of um, a tutorial for would be candidates on how to talk about the issues. Um, the idea that Gingrich had. And the thing we that we really try to get across to folks with this podcast who don't remember it or didn't live through it, you know, was that the, the Republican Party in the late 70s and into the 80s in, in, in the House and, and nationally was a lot more ideologically diverse, um, I think, than it is now. True, the Democratic Party as well. The parties weren't sorted out the way they now are. And Gingrich wanted the Republican Party to be defined as the conservative party. And he wanted that to be infused with a little bit of populism, but he wanted it to be the anti-tax party. He wanted it to be the anti-elite party. He wanted it to be the party that was opposed to big government, that wanted to you know, dramatically cut the size and scope of government. And he wanted to create a contrast between that and a Democratic party that he wanted people to identify with, you know, big government and a welfare state and high taxes and big spending and, and, and things like that. And the the idea of the tapes was to teach people to teach republican would be republican candidates how to communicate on those terms how to stress what 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 would a gingrich type of republican believed in and how to make that contrast to what democrats believed in because ultimately what he was trying to do what gingrich was trying to do the strategy to win the house was to nationalize politics because he felt if he felt that that basic contrast i just described was a winner it was a winner for Republicans nationally. It's why Reagan was able to win two landslides. It's why Bush was able to crush Dukakis in 88. It's why Nixon was able to win over George McGovern in 72 by such a landslide. And he felt if if voters took that same sense of contrast into the voting booth in every individual House district around the country, there'd be a Republican majority. So the, these tapes were Newt's way, and they would just, the, Gil Gutnick's a great example, state legislator in Minnesota, gets the tapes, he's listening to him to and from his, you know, his commute to uh, to St. Paul, and he's learning to communicate like new. And you got to imagine for these these guys who were, you know, young, 20s, 30s, whatever it was, you know, starting out in Republican politics with big aspirations of, of getting to Washington. It was kind of exciting stuff because, I mean, you, you heard it in, in the language that Newt's using there. Um, I mean, he's setting extremely high dramatic stakes. This could be the role you play in history, and here's how to do it. And that was something new that was being offered, you know, to Republicans. It wasn't come to Washington, be in the minority, and maybe after 20 years you could become the ranking member on appropriations. I mean, it, you know, um, it, it was something much more exciting than that. And I think that's how he ultimately built his, uh, his power. Did you listen to any of the tapes, and are they available for people to hear today? Yeah, they're, um, they're tougher to find than I thought, although I did hear from somebody after um, – um, 
after the podcast came out who has a complete set so i want to try to i want to try to, uh, I want to, try to listen uh, uh uh to those but there are some in in the archives down at in uh, georgia um gil gutnick was nice enough to, to to share some with us too um but it was um you know what it, i mean what it really was you have limbaugh in there too um i mean it was a version of of the rush limbaugh show you know limbaugh was was, was doing was much more entertaining he had a an entertainer's flair to how he was presenting it. But, but Limbaugh was, was, you know, kind of pushing the same basic message on the radio three hours a day as Newt was in the tapes and as Newt was, he, Limbaugh was pushing that same contrast of Republicans versus Democrats, conservatives, opportunity, you know, uh, uh, versus liberals and welfare state, that sort of thing. I mean, that was what Limbaugh was basically trying to push every day too. So it was, there was that merger Kind of in the late '80s of, of of Newt on the inside in in Congress, in Limbaugh on the outside, reaching 20 million people on the airwaves every day, and and that was a, a that was a big ingredient. You talked to former Congressman Bob Walker and Ben Weber and others. Were there any of the participants back in those days with Newt Gingrich that wouldn't talk to you? Um, in terms of his core allies. Uh, I know, I think we got, we, we kind of, what we wanted Walker and we wanted uh, Weber. I think they were probably the, the two closest. Uh, we did reach out, I believe, um, to Trent Lott. Trent Lott had been in the House. You know, he left for the Senate in 1988. Um, and I, you know, that, that unfortunately, I don't think that one worked out. But I thought Walker and Walker and Weber were two of the, uh, the very first, you know, it, it, to, to line up with Newt in the, you know, late seventies, early eighties. Um, and, and, and a big part of this is, you know, it's almost like guerrilla warfare on the house floor that, that they were kind of staging in, in 1982, 83, 84. Um, that's one of, one of my favorite episodes we did involves a confrontation between Newt and uh, Tip O'Neill and Walker and Weber were, were very central to that and wanted to make sure to get them both. Is there any way to quantify the amount of time you personally put in researching to be ready to do the podcast? Um, it's tough to, because there, there was, I put a lot in for this podcast, but it was also the culmination of, I mean, I've, I've been fascinated by this stuff for years. So I've, you know, I, I, a lot of the, you know, source material, um, I knew where to look for it cause I'd already heard it or I'd already seen it. Um, wrote a book a couple of years ago called the, uh, the red and the blue. And it, it's sort of the story of politics in the 90s it's a lot of Clinton it's a lot of Newt and so some of this is also is also in that so I I, I, I got a lot from that uh, from that research as well but it really was it's it's um, uh, you know something I've, I've 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 just kind of I've absorbed a lot of material about it through the year I can remember again in that early years of my political uh, 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 interest uh, one of the first books I read Again, from Massachusetts, Tip O'Neill was this towering figure in Massachusetts, and um, his memoir was Man of the House. And um, I mean, I remember reading uh, this early '90s, reading him uh, his section on Newt Gingrich, and uh, and that, that knowing about that confrontation that we get into in the podcast, that big on uh, House floor confrontation between Tip O'Neill and Newt Gingrich. Um, that's my first memory of it. So that's 30 years ago. How many? politicians had you met before you got into the journalism side of this and did you work in any campaigns um i worked on it uh uh yes my um 19 1994 interestingly enough um was a volunteer in a, a local um campaign for state representative in um in massachusetts bob hargraves uh was his name the first uh middlesex district of massachusetts um uh, he was Republican, and he it was an interesting campaign because um, he uh, this is way more than anyone wants to know about the first Middlesex district of Massachusetts. But the the incumbent actually passed away right before the primary, and there was one other name on the ballot, and none of the local Republicans wanted that that person to have the nomination. So Hargraves ran a write-in campaign in the primary, and I remember we we had to send stickers out ballot it was a big thing to do was we sat in somebody's basement mailing stickers out to every voter in the district because you could put the sticker on the ballot and they would count it as a vote and he won the nomination then he won the general election and then he um um it's a very you know 
gracious thing for him to do. I still remember to this day, he invited me to the, um, to his swearing in, um, in January 95. So it was, I, I got to be on the floor of the state house in Massachusetts, uh, for his swearing in. And it was also the swearing in of, uh, Bill Weld for his, uh, for his second term as governor and got to see all these, uh, if anyone, a name people might know nationally, Billy Bulger, who was the, the longtime state Senate president in Massachusetts, um, among other things. So got to see him and, and, uh, um, that was a, uh, that was, that's a very memorable experience. Here's another clip from episode three. It gets into the real meat of, um, of uh, the Gingrich relationship with Speaker Wright. Let's listen to that and get your feedback from it. In the opinion of the chair, the eyes have it. That's Wright presiding. He's trying to pass the bill. The voice vote is ceremonial. Now there will be a recorded vote to put each member on the record. If you've watched C-SPAN over the years, you know how this looks on TV. The sound of the House floor is muted, classical music plays, and members cast their votes by electronic device and then mill about and watch the tally board. Stick with me here because the procedural details matter. If you watch the C-SPAN footage from this particular vote in November 1987, what you'll see on the screen is the usual vote tally and countdown clock set for the usual 15 minutes. And when the time runs out, the vote tally stops at 205 yeas and 206 nays. That means the Democrats and Speaker Wright have lost by one vote. Gingrich is in the camera shot here. He's smiling, he's standing behind Bob Michael, and it looks like he reaches over to shake somebody's hand. This is a big moment for the Republicans. They're the minority party, Wright is a powerful speaker, but they've won this vote. They've convinced just enough Democrats to join them in opposing Wright's tax bill. They're ready to celebrate. But when the sound of the chamber comes back on, the speaker doesn't confirm the numbers that were just on screen. Any other members in the chamber who desire to vote? And so now suddenly there are 206 yeses and only 205 noes. If there are no other members on this vote. And then Newt Gingrich gets on the mic. Once the speaker has said the vote is closed and all time has expired, and that is on this tape, we have it on the videotape. Once that has been done, how can it be reopened? What do you think? <laughs> I really wanted to make sure we included that full story in this podcast because the the single thing that made Newt Gingrich among Republicans in this long rise to, to power, I think more than anything else, was taking down Jim Wright as the House Speaker in 1989, forcing Jim Wright to resign. And I think this moment that you're hearing there from November 1987 is foundational to that because we try to get across here in the podcast is people are always talking about how Congress has changed and the, you know, the sort of the norms have changed and it, the idea of a backbencher, and that's what Newt Gingrich still was in, in November 1987. He was, he was gaining a name for himself, but he was not yet in leadership. The idea of a backbencher going after a sitting House Speaker on ethics charges, filing ethics charges against a sitting House Speaker was for most Republicans, even those who didn't like Jim Wright that much, a bridge too far. It just wasn't done. Um, and that that vote we just took you through where this was, you know, Wright had a vision of the speakership. He had just taken over at the start of that year from Tip O'Neill, who had retired. And Wright wanted a much more centralized speakership. He wanted to be a more singular figure. Um, and he wanted that tax vote to, to go through as leverage for dealing with the Reagan administration. And he, you know, this is this is something that Tom DeLay would do years later and drive Democrats nuts. But um, he held the vote open, knowing that there's this ex, there's this congressman from Texas who owes his seat in the House to Jim Wright and has told Jim Wright, I'm for you if you absolutely need me. And, you know, when the vote originally fails, Wright holds the vote open, calls in the favor, 
gets the guy to the House floor, changes his vote, you know, and, and it's it, Republicans, the reaction from Republicans, you hear Gingrich there, he's irate, but it's not just Gingrich. I mean, this is, you know, Bob Michael, who's the Republican leader who represents a very different style of politics, conservative, but he represents a very different style of politics than Newt Gingrich. Um, and Bob Michael is just as irate as Newt Gingrich when this happens. And I think it's no coincidence that it's it's pretty much in the immediate wake of that episode that Gingrich goes forward with the ethics campaign, the formal ethics complaint and the ethics campaign against Jim Wright. And I think I think had it not been, I wonder and I, I suspect if it had not been for that in that kind of, you know, uh, those kind of actions from Wright, I think somebody like Michael would have tried to rein in Gingrich in taking that step. Um, and if it had been, if Tip O'Neill had still been speaker and, and Newt Gingrich had decided to wage a, an ethics campaign against him, this is something I asked Gingrich when we sat down and talked. I said, could you have done something like that against Tip O'Neill? And he said, no, absolutely not. You know, just O'Neill, even, even among Republicans who didn't like his politics, they liked him personally, generally. They didn't really, li Republicans didn't like Wright. And in an episode like that, they felt Wright was trampling all over them. And then so suddenly, Here's Newt Gingrich offering them a way to to fight back. Even the ones who would have been queasy before suddenly they, they weren't going to stop him. When you and a lot of what I want to ask you is about how you put this together, because people certainly can go and listen to your seven part series. When you got down to having to produce it itself, how much time did that take you because of the music? And how did you work that out among your six people? Yeah, the the music I I literally I didn't hear until until I heard the final cut and like I said it was just like oh there's music in this and then <laughs> oh it's good it's it's great it really it I can't believe how much it helps um, but um, yeah we we would get a um, we would hammer out a script and and each episode was about thirty five to forty pages um, there was a lot of writing rewriting back and forth just just kind of hammering out the script and then you know. You, you think that's the hard part. I'm used to just from writing, you know, once once you get everybody on the same page with the script, you're done. Then you got to go record. And the recording is read this line. Now read it again. Now emphasize this word. Now emphasize that word. Try it one more time. You know, so um, each each episode, again, 35 to 40 pages of script. Um, we would take a first pass through that would take about two hours. Then we'd come back about a day or two later and there'd be notes, you know, uh, each line was numbered, you know, there'd be hundreds and there'd be notes about a few dozen of them. So we'd have to redo those and then we'd redo another set of them. So it ended up being three or four days of, of uh, taping a couple hours each day um, for each episode, just to try to get the right, what they wanted, I could see in hindsight was you know, to, to have a number of different options for these reads, different tones, landing different ways. And then, um, you know, we, we, we had, you know, our, our, um, or audio engineer just who, who kind of who figured out, I think, kind of brilliantly exactly the right one for, for the right spot and put it all together. How did you determine the optimum length for each of the episodes? Um, I, I think they felt, you know, 40, 45 minutes or so is is about the right time on these. Um, yeah, I was working with a team that's done a number of, of different podcasts before, and I think that was just kind of their sense from um, from having done them before, because believe me, the, um, the, the scripts that I would kind of send over to them definitely ran longer than 45 minutes. And it's, it's, I had this experience writing the, writing that book a few years ago. I remember I, I turned in 170,000 words and the editor cut it down to 140,000. And I remember just seeing page after page of red lines crossing stuff out. And it was painful because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh, we're losing this essential story. We're losing that essential point. And now, a couple of years later, I, I honestly couldn't even tell you what the stuff was that was taken out. And I kind of, it was kind of the same with this podcast. You know, I would see all of these cuts made from the scripts and I'd wince and I'd say, oh, oh it's not going to make any sense. But once I heard it, I, I, I forgot most of the stuff that, that, that we had taken out. What podcasts do you listen to now uh, that mostly are, are about politics that you uh, respect? Um, what got, I'll tell you what, what got me really interested in this genre, um, was, um, 
series from Leon Nafok, mm. um, and he started slow burn. And he's I don't think they're called slow burn anymore. I think he switched kind of you know places. Um, but his first one was about Watergate. His second one was about the um, Clinton Lewinsky. Um, he did one on the the 2000 election. He was taking, you know, and I, he's, he's a former um, colleague of mine. I used to write for the New York Observer um, once upon a time. And um, I, I just remember sending him, you know, a note when I first heard it and, and just saying, this this is fantastic. Like this is, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of I'm a little bit jealous here. I wish this is, you know, stuff I was doing. Um, but I thought he did he did some terrific stuff there. And it was I, the, the um, Clinton Lewinsky one, in fact, he um, um, I never actually asked him how, but I, I, I think he struck some kind of deal with NBC because the the main um, source for for the you know news nightly news the, the news footage that was used was NBC um, you know for that podcast. So it was one of those where I was just I'm, I'm listening to it. I'm saying, but I've always been interested in doing something like this, and now I'm hearing somebody kind of do exactly that. I was like, I got to be able to get this place interested in this. Um, in this and, and that was that was that was what got me really pushing them and it, it did take a few years but but we got there i remember finding his serial uh series on on watergate on television on the epics channel and i think it's probably still there uh it's a, a long series uh it was yeah i, I it made it, it's made me wonder if there's a uh if there's a, a video version of the uh of the uh, uh, of the revolution, but uh, we haven't had any talks. What what what's your sense of <clears throat> doing a podcast versus doing video? You know, it's um, I don't think I don't think anything was lost not having the video for all of these clips. Um, and it's um, I, I was wondering when we started if it if it would be, and and when I heard it back, it I, I, I don't think so. Um, the only thing I can I can think of that might be that's that's a little bit missing is for folks who know what Newt Gingrich looks like or what Rush Limbaugh looked like or you know, these these major players. See, when, when you get the video, you're seeing him 30 years ago. You're seeing him 35 years ago. You're seeing what the, the graphics on TV looked like 30, 35 years ago. And there's a little bit. I I, I think that's that. There's there's a funness to that. I think and 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 you don't you don't get that. When you make it a podcast, but I think in terms of understanding the story, um, uh, I, I I think you can picture it. You know, you could those that scene you just played from the you know the House floor, the Jim Wright, you know, Newt Gingrich uh, battle. A lot of I, I imagine a lot of folks who listen to this do not know what Jim Wright looks like, so they got to create. But I think there's a, there, there's a little bit of a fun in that too, where it's um, we describe him, we we describe his style. You know, he's a Texan. You can hear that in his voice. You know he's from the older generation, and and I think you can. It's kind of like reading a you know reading fiction. You, you got to create you know your own picture in your head, and I think I think there's a little fun in that. In your interview with Newt Gingrich, that happened after you did the first six podcasts. Uh, there, there's a story that came up that you all talked about the CNN debate in 2012. That's what's that story with John King from CNN, and also the impact that it might have had on Donald Trump. Yeah, I wanted to uh, to ask him about this because um, I had been uh, on Hugh Hewitt, the, the conservative radio host. I had been on his show um, at some point in the last year, and and he said that I forgot the context, but he said that the if you wanted to understand Donald Trump's rise among Republicans in 2016. The origin story is Newt Gingrich's South Carolina debate up uh, in 2012 when Gingrich was running for president. And, and the context of that was, um, you know, Gingrich was heading into the South Carolina primary. Romney was the front runner. Um, and Gingrich was probably at 10 percent in the polls in South Carolina. It looked like it was pretty much over. And here's a debate a couple days before the primary. And Gingrich's second wife, um, who'd been his wife when he was House Speaker, um, gives an interview to ABC News Nightline and says essentially that um, he had he had asked for an open marriage and word that ABC was going to air this interview and, and excerpts from the interview leaked leaked out right before the debate. The actual segment didn't air until after the debate it was on Nightline that, that night. And so CNN was hosting the debate. John King was moderating 
And he started the debate by saying this was, you know, this is being reported by ABC News. Um, you know, Mr. Gingrich, do you have a comment on it? And Gingrich just um, pour into the um, I, paraphrasing. This is this is the kind of garbage that turns everybody off to politics. The fact that you would start a debate for president of the United States, not on a substantive issue of concern to Americans, but on some cheap, tawdry, you know, on and on like that. And it, it is when, when Hewitt had told me that it stuck in my head. And when I was going to interview Gingrich, I, I rewatched it. And it's it's very easy to find on YouTube. And it is striking because it's there's a live audience for the debate. There must be a thousand people in the convention hall. And. I, I am sure most of them did not show up that night as Gingrich supporters, because like I said, he was probably at 10% in the polls. The, within 20 seconds of, of this, of, of Gingrich laying into King, the crowd isn't just clapping, they're standing, they're giving a standing ovation. And and he goes on for two or three minutes, he takes two or three passes at it. And you just, you watch that clip and you just feel this this energy, this 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 power in the room. I mean, whatever, whatever you think of Gingrich's answer, I'm just I'm just saying he clearly has tapped into something profound here. And of course, he did over in, in three or four days. He jumped 30 points in the polls. He won the South Carolina primary by double digits over Romney. Um, didn't end up getting the nomination, but it was one of those moments where you know I, I think Hewitt believes, and, and I've talked to other people since who who kind of believe that's something Trump saw, and saw the power of and sought to channel that in in 2016 and that's that's what i wanted to ask gingrich was you know did he think that that trump had watched his performance in 2012 and and did that shape how he ran his rhetoric toward the media the, the, just the, the sort of you know that trump made so much of his campaign in 2016 a drama of trump versus the media and and trying to understand i, I wanted to understand that and i wanted to understand from Gingrich, what it was that he was tapping into, because it's there's no question it was powerful. I want to understand what he thinks it was, and and he talked about you know the the it's an it's an old I think we all know. I mean you could you could think of you know as, as I said you think of Spiro Agnew fifty years ago. You could think of I know you know Dan Rather conservatives didn't like him much in the seventies. It's an old story of conservatives distrusting national television media, but I but I, what I want to know is is it. Is it deeper now? Is it is it more deeply felt now? And he didn't hesitate to say yes, absolutely. And that's one of the things I explored with him in the interviews. Why that is? What do you think? What's your own view of? And as a matter of fact, I'll throw in this: uh, if you were advising a politician, and I know you might advise the Republicans one way and the Democrats the other, what would you say about this whole issue that uh, of, of uh, challenging uh, the, the journalists? I, yeah, it's, it fascinates me because I, like I said, I think it just so. I, I've become very interested in trying to understand the the, the evolution of media. I mean, I, I guess to backtrack, the big picture story we're telling with this podcast isn't just the Republican takeover of Congress; it's the nationalization of our politics, and and that's something that Newt understood. He understood that media was changing. Um, in a way that was going to make it a lot easier to nationalize politics. And then he wanted, again, that 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 contrast I was describing, he wanted folks seeing it in every in every corner of the country. And, and that's something that's, that's that's just happened. I mean, more and more than ever, people vote straight ticket Democratic, straight ticket Republican. And I think something that's really, you know, kind of moved that process along, accelerated that process is the evolution of media in the last, you know, let's say, generation or so, um, where you, you, once you identify with team blue or team red, you can just, you know, live in the team blue information bubble or live in the team red information bubble. And so when Gingrich describes what he's tapping into in a, in a moment like that in the debate, um, or Hugh Hewitt says, this is, this is what Trump took and brought to a new level in 2016, what I see is, um, yeah, why would that be more palpable now? Because if you're on the right, there are all sorts of sort of alternative media sources that you can that can. Um, it's not like the 1970s where it was ABC, CBS, NBC with the nightly news, 
and your daily newspaper. And basically that was it, you know, unless you were one of those people who subscribe to these you know, political newsletters or something. Now there's ABC, there's CBS, there's NBC. There's also cable news channels. There's also internet, Facebook, Twitter, social media. There's talk radio, there's a, a podcast. So if you're on the right and you, the elite media to, to take Newt Gingrich's term um, is reporting something, um, you can turn to an endless number of sources for a rebuttal and for a different perspective and for a, 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 a different way of understanding an event potentially. And I, I, I just, I think that's brought, that's just ratcheted up that tension um, in a way that just when there were far fewer media sources, just couldn't be. When you want to listen to the right wing on media, where do you go? Um, I think it depends. I, um, I try to listen to the, uh, to Hugh Hewitt's show, um, you know, when I can, I think, I think he's a, that's a pretty good, um, um, it's not just Hewitt himself. He brings on a lot of guests who I think he, it, it, you kind of take the temperature. Um, I'll listen to, um, national review, um, has a, uh, a podcast, the editors that, um, that I listen to it's, um, it, one of the challenges I think in trying to understand Republican politics right now is that, that there's still, um, this, this sort of disconnect between a lot of the, um, the, 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 like you talk about like a national review or something, you'll hear a lot more skepticism about Donald Trump um, there than I think maybe exists among the average Republican voter. I think that was a major theme in the 2016 campaign. Um, I think that was, I think there was a lot of conservative, you know, right-leaning outlets made efforts to really understand the Trump voters and, 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 and to incorporate a lot of their, um, that understanding into their coverage, but I think there's still I'm I, I'm 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 aware that there's there can there can still be a bit of a gap there. In fact, I think that's the biggest question I have right now. So I'm just looking forward to 2024, and there's, everybody's trying to figure out Trump, DeSantis, maybe someone else. But it's it's I, I really don't know. I'm picking up from a lot of these right leaning media sources in eagerness for DeSantis to emerge and to eclipse Trump. But I'm remembering the, these folks also had an eagerness for anybody but Trump to emerge and, and eclipse Trump in 2015 and 2016, and it didn't end up happening back then. And so I'm I'm, I, I'm trying to keep that in mind as I as I hear this chorus right now, heading into 2024. That not just because you're hearing more people uh, in in right leaning media say it doesn't mean it'll happen. Here is a, a final ec excerpt from your <clears throat> uh, podcast. This is the. Uh, I, be we, I believe we're not absolutely sure you can tell us. I believe this is the Gingrich interview. You used a lot of Gingrich. It wasn't your interview, but let's listen to this because it brings up a very interesting story about uh, the uh, Indiana 8th, as I'm sure you're mm. prepared for. Let's listen to this. Panetta says there were a lot of factors at play here, but I think the thing that really kind of sent the House in the wrong direction was the fact that Newt and some of the other Republicans at that time decided that with television in the House, the best thing to do was to really try to undermine the faith of the American people in the institution of the House. And I think that hurt the House, and it frankly hurt both Republicans and Democrats. It was a strategy that basically said, we are going to undermine faith in the House, even if it hurts Republicans, because it's about this larger mission of tearing the place down in order to get power. That, that argument that you torched the place, and that's what got you to power, but also permanently wrecked Congress, essentially. What, what, what do you say to critics who say that? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I, I like Leon and I admire him and we've been friends. Uh, but remember that Leon is the Democrat who chaired the committee, which stole the seat in Indiana. And when it came down to it, in the end, he did what Tony Coelho told him to, which was steal the seat. Look, the, somebody wrote a book the other week. I haven't had time to really critique, but I'd like to, could, about the destructionist. Well, they're right. I, I set out with three goals. Change the welfare state, defeat the Democrats in Congress, and defeat the Soviet empire. Well, you could argue if you were a good Soviet that I was a destructionist. You could argue if you're a good Democrat that I was a destructionist. And you could argue if you were a liberal who believed in the original welfare state that I was a destructionist. I... That's what. It, that's why I was elected, Mr. Kornacki. 
that's another, it, you know, the bloody eighth um, in, in <laughs> Indiana. Um, you know, this district, this, this, this gets back to, um, night was, it came after the 1984 election and, um, the democratic incumbent appeared to have been defeated by the Republican challenger, Reagan landslide in 84. This is a district that had changed hands countless times over the previous two decades. And the, the Democrat, Frank McCloskey, the incumbent, um, you know, contested the election and, you know, the, the House has the ultimate, it is the ultimate authority um, on elections to the House. They can, the House can choose whether to seat somebody or not to seat somebody or who to seat. And so it's it, basically this whole drama from the 84 election into the spring, late spring of 1985, where the Democratic controlled House refused to seat the Republican, who twice got certifications from the Secretary of State in Indiana, a Republican Secretary of State and set up this committee of, of, of three people, two Democrats, one Republican. The, the, the chair of the committee was Leon Panetta from California, and they, a special task force, and they basically, you know, it, it, was a, it was a precursor in some ways, if anybody remembers the, uh, the 2000 election in Florida and, and the folks holding up the ballots, the punch card ballots, and trying to decide, you know, is this one punched all the way through? Is this a Gore ballot? Is this a Bush ballot? That's what they were doing in Indiana's 8th District in the spring of of 1985 and you know it, it ends up being a situation where key votes all go two to one two democrats one way one republican the other way and they end up declaring the democrat the, this, the task force the task force does the winner uh, by a four vote margin and they seat frank mccloskey i think it's the very end of may of 1985 um and again it's just one of these moments where where newt has been trying to convince the republicans for years that they're being, you know, the Democrats are abusing their power, trampling all over them, taking it for granted, and that they have to fight back. They have to be much more aggressive and much more united in, in fighting back against Democrats. And this is one of those moments, I think, that, that really wins him a batch of new converts because the Republicans in real time see this as just what Gingrich is saying in the interview. They see this as the Democrats abusing their power to steal an election that they didn't win. And it's a it's a an amazing um, scene. I think we, we we have some of the audio from it uh, in the uh, in the podcast. But the 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 part that really sticks out most to me is Tip O'Neill is still the Speaker of the House, and Bob Michael's the Republican leader. And Tip O'Neill and Bob Michael had a very unique and special relationship. They were truly good friends. They enjoyed each other's company. They liked each other enormously. Um, and Tip O'Neill. Uh, it moves to swear in Frank McCloskey after this vote is taken and the Republicans stage a walkout in the House and O'Neill calls out to Bob Michael, his friend, and says, would the gentleman please stay, you know, out of respect to the new member? And Michael says no and leaves and with Gingrich. And I, I think it was symbolically it was that's Michael and Gingrich were always two very different people. And, you know, my one regret is, unfortunately, you know, Michael passed a few years ago. I, I would love to have been able to to talk to him for this podcast and, 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 and get his, his perspective on it. But I think, you know, it's, it's such a powerful moment in the rise of Gingrich, the rise of his style of politics, and ultimately the creation of that majority in 1994. Such a big moment when some, and even Bob Michael spurns his friend Tip O'Neill and spurns the idea of welcoming the member being sworn in and joins Gingrich in the walkout. I don't know why I looked this up, but I looked up both Frank McCloskey and Rick McIntyre and where they are today. It turns out that McCloskey died in 2003 at age 64 of cancer, and Rick McIntyre died in 2007 at age 51 of an apparent suicide. And it's always interesting when you look back at where some of these people are that you are talking about in your podcast. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I I did the same actually because I, I I actually this I had the thought that I knew McCloskey had passed, um, but I, I remember McIntyre was an up and comer. Yeah, you know, I think he was like 28 years old or something in '84. Um, he actually ran a rematch against McCloskey in '86 and, and, and got beat. But I had the same thought. I was like, we, let's get him for the podcast. And then, yeah, it turns out his 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 I think his life had kind of taken a turn there, and um, it ends up being just a, a tragic story. I wanted to ask you uh, in your interview with. Uh, 
Newt Gingrich, there were a number of times where he said something like he just, we just heard him say, I like Leon and we've been friends. How is that possible in a town like this now with the bitter, especially around Newt Gingrich, who <clears throat> a lot of Democrats, I, I think I could say hated. Yeah, it, it's, it, well, it was interesting with, uh, with some of these interviews and, and talking to Gingrich. Um, I think one person he, he clearly had, um, one Democrat he had respect for, and I think there was mutual respect because we interviewed him for this podcast, was Tony Coelho. Um, and, and Tony Coelho was, in his own way, um, trying to change the Democratic Party, the House Democrats in the 1980s, in, in a way kind of analogous to what, what Newt was doing. He was also trying to nationalize things. Tony Coelho was really trying to connect the Democrats with, with big dollar donors, trying to make more of an alliance between business and Democrats. And, you know, to, his vehicle for that was the DCCC and, and really trying to turn that into something huge. Um, and I, I think he and Gingrich kind of enjoyed just going at each other in, in the 80s. And there was kind of a, a mutual respect. Um, I, I was we, we talked to Steny Hoyer. Um, you know, obviously, who was there for all this and is still there. Um, did not get a sense there's any lingering <laughs> affection on, on Hoyer's part for Gingrich. But we talked to Dick Gephardt too. Gephardt was the you know was the minority leader while Newt was uh, was speaker. And I, I deep deep disagreements, um, but I, I did pick up on a respect there, um, a mutual one. And I and I and I and I you know Gephardt. I was I went into the Gephardt interview. Not sure what to expect, and and if I had to guess, expecting that um, it was going to be, you know, very very negative toward Newt. And there was a lot that he said about Newt, his role in the House. There was a lot he does not like about what Newt did and what Newt represented. But I think there was, there was, and it comes through in some of the interviews with him. I think I think there was a deeper, um, there was a bit of a, of a respect there um, that I, um, you know, that surprised me. I listened to all seven of your podcasts. I've listened to you for the last hour here. And um, from my perspective, and I watch a lot of television, listen to a lot of radio, I have no idea how you really feel about any of these people. How do you do it? I think the stories, I, I love telling these stories. I love immersing myself in these stories. I'm fascinated by the characters. Um, I love political history because of the what ifs. Um, I love being able to go back and I can, I, I, the, the, the fun part about research when I say I can spend all day in the archives is I really feel when I dive back into the Indiana eighth and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm watching an NBC newscast from February of 1985. I really feel like in that moment that I'm back in February of 1985. And even though on one level, I know where the story ends in that moment, I don't. And I, all I can see are the, all of the different possibilities and I, I i like to put myself back into those moments because i think you can understand the motivations of everybody who was involved they, they make sense when you when you're able to do that i think it's fun just to to kind of ponder all of the different you know different courses the different routes that, that history could have taken i think it's fun to ponder it and i think you, you can kind of learn lessons from um from from what did happen and you just try to understand why why was this ultimately the thing that happened but but i wanted to tell a um i i, I just i think this is a we, we have here with gingrich with the, the the long you know rise to power and and everything we've been talking about for the last hour i just think it's a rich story with fascinating characters um with with a, a lot of implications for for where american politics are today and my interest was in in telling that story and telling it away, telling it in a way where whatever side you were on during it, you can listen to it and say, that is the story, you know, <laughs> that is the basic story. And and if, if, if I can get people from the de Democratic side and the Republican side to say that, then, then that's a success. I, I know you probably don't want to give it away, but have you got an inkling as to what you would like to do next in podcast land? Um, I, yeah, I do. I, 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 I have... A list of five or six that that I would love to dive into. Um, I'm not sure yet whether we'll uh, uh, whether we'll be able to. I very much hope we'll be able to, and um, um, and, and and hopefully um, hopefully I'd be able to uh, to come back and talk to you about it. And I do want to just say before before this ends, it is the you asked me what the the thing is 
that the people say to me the most, and I've noticed through the years, the thing that at least the callers say to you the most is thank you for C-SPAN. But this, this podcast, thank you for C-SPAN because the C-SPAN archive played a huge role in, in this podcast. Um, your interviews, you, know, you had a series of exit interviews with, with Gingrich in 1999 when he stepped down as speaker. Um, that was a, before he would talk to us, that was a, a rich source of material for us. But um, this, this is, Newt Gingrich arrived in Congress in early 1979. The C-SPAN cameras went live about two months later. And so many of the stories that we tell in this podcast, we've got plenty of NBC News footage, but we've got even more C-SPAN footage, I think, in here. And so truly, truly, um, for this podcast and for, for, for the last few decades of my life, thank you for C-SPAN. If people want to listen to all seven, where do they find, what's the easiest way to tell them where to go to find your podcast, The, Re uh, the Revolution? I, yeah, I would say go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and, and search for The Revolution with Steve Kornacki. And I think if you just type in The Revolution, that'll probably get you close enough. <laughs> Steve Kornacki, thank you so much for giving us some background and, inf and some inside information on how you put this together. Brian, thanks for having me. This was great fun. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.